Hallelujah. It's been a week of good news, praise the Lord. You know, you sow the seeds of faith and it was launched. Ted was on his way to, to Israel, but something happened. So he was meant to be here. Amen? And we're excited about that. We're going to have a very unique Passover this year. Hallelujah. You know, last, <clears throat> last Thursday, um, I was over at the house that we are fixing up. Actually, James uh, dropped by uh, yesterday, as a matter of fact, because I home from work, so I gave him the tour. <clears throat> but, uh, yeah, on Thursday I was working over there, and we have a next-door neighbor. He's obviously retired. He's always kind of hanging out, you know, front and stuff whenever I'm there. And, and uh, he was outside that time when I arrived, and, you know, we exchanged a few pleasantries. And uh, then he asked, he goes, hey, that, uh, that older guy that's always here. <laughs> I assume that's your dad. Hi, dad. <laughs> I said, no. No, he's not my dad. But he is an elder in my congregation. That's right, he said. Hey, you're a minister, aren't you? And I said, well, y yes, yes, I, I, I am. And then he went on to share with me uh, how he had recently been challenged by a family member who's a retired minister uh, regarding something that he always had sort of believed biblically, something he always believed he was right about. And he said, when I studied the word, he said, I found out I was wrong after all. Um, I, I should have known, I should have known the minister would be right. And I looked at him for a moment there and I said, well, not always. Not always. We are working out our salvation just like you are. Amen. Amen. You know, returning to our Torah portion that Shabbos Potus read for us from Shemot or Exodus 12, verses 18 to 20, states from the evening of the 14th day, now of course we're talking about on a lunar cycle, the biblical days, amen, the 14th day of the first month, which we know to be Nisan or um, pre-Babylon was Aviv, until the evening of the 21st day, you are to eat matzah, and during those seven days, no leaven is to be found in your houses. Whoever eats food with chametz in it is to be cut off from the community of Israel. It doesn't matter whether he is a foreigner or a citizen of the land. Eat nothing with chametz in it. Where, wherever you live, eat matzah. Now, this passage has always kind of confused me a little bit in the past. Well, it seems pretty cut and dry, doesn't it? You see anything confusing in there at all? Anybody? No? Nothing confusing? Well, take a look at the passage again. If you count from 14 to 21, you don't get seven days. You get eight days. You get eight days. Eight days that we are commanded to eat matzah, or unleavened bread. But in verse 19, it says that we are only to eat matzah for seven days. Not eight. Furthermore, the 14th, the day of Pesach, is included in this seven-day avoidance of yeast, or si'or, and leavened bread, chametz. And this further confused me, <clears throat> because in Vayikra, or Leviticus, chapter 23, verses 5 to 8, <clears throat> the scriptures tell us that Pesach, or Passover, is on the 14th, a Nisan or a Viv, and the first day of Chagamatzot or unleavened bread starts on the next day on the 15th of Nisan with seven following days of unleavened bread. Surely this would equal eight separate and complete days of observance, right? Same. But it's really not that simple. Maybe that is why when we read in 2 Timothy, chapter 2, verse 15, who exhorts us to diligently study so that we won't be ashamed being able to rightly divide the word of truth. But many a person who has sat down <clears throat> to study the chronology and dates of Pesach or Passover and Chagamatzot, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, have struggled 
to understand all the various texts and how you sort of reconcile this mitzvah, this instruction, and the dating of these commands therein. See, for 20 years, brothers and sisters, I have celebrated Pesach one day earlier than most of traditional Judaism. Why? <laughs> you might want to know or ask, and some of you have. Well, for one thing, because the Torah tells us to celebrate it on the 14th day of Nisan. And because biblical days are reckoned from sundown to sundown, it only made sense to me to observe the beginning of Pesach the evening before, like any biblical Sabbath or holy day. Therefore, to me, that meant that Pesach started after Nisan 13 at sundown or sunset. And uh, we would then observe the actual day of Pesach until the next evening, at which time would be the beginning of the first day of Chakamatzot, right? But the rest of Judaism celebrates their actual Seder on the 15th of Nisan, which I felt at the time to be kind of more tradition than biblical accuracy, uh, a departure from the Torah, in my thought. So this year, if you haven't caught it yet, some of you maybe have because you're astute, but if you haven't caught it yet, we will be celebrating Pesach on Nisan 14 into Nisan 15, which takes place on Wednesday, April 8th. Why? Why am I doing this? Because ministers are not always right. My position was based upon the interpretation that Yeshua both partook of the Pesach Seder and then became the Pesach sacrifice. What I had reconciled is Yeshua being the Word, other portions of scriptures regarding the timing of the observance of Pesach would be holding Yeshua in very contempt of his own Word. For example, returning to today's portion, Shemot or Exodus chapter 12, verse 11, states the following about how we are to eat the Pesach. Pay attention. Here's how you are to eat it with your belt fastened, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you are to eat it hurriedly. It is Adonai's Pesach. Adonai's Passover. <clears throat> See, the text says we are to eat the Pesach in haste and to be ready. And this leads us to, therefore, to Shemot or Exodus 12, 17, where it says, you are to observe the festival of Matzah, for on this very day I brought your divisions out of the land of Egypt. Therefore, you are to observe this day from generation to generation by a perpetual regulation. Now, if you already eat the Pesach, or the Passover, in haste, and the first day of Chagam is the same day, that Adonai made B'nai Yisrael, the children of Israel, come out of Mitzrayim or Egypt, then, unlike what I've taught for 20 odd years, the two passages support the idea that there was not a whole day of waiting. <laughs> there wasn't a whole 24 hours of waiting around between the eating of the Passover lamb and the departure from Egypt. Not only was Israel commanded to eat the Pesach in haste, but that night, the people of Mitzrayim compelled Israel to leave immediately. <laughs> Get out of here. And I'll read from Shemot, Exodus, uh, chapter 12, verse 29 to 32. At midnight, Adonai killed all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Paro, sitting on the throne, to the firstborn of the prisoner in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of livestock. Pharaoh got up in the night, he, all his servants, and all the Egyptians, and there was, was horrendous wailing in Egypt, for there wasn't a single house without someone dead in it. 
And he summoned Moshe and Aharon by night and said, Up and lead my people, both you and the people of Israel, and go, serve Adonai, as you said. Take both your flocks and your herds, as you said, and get out of here. <laughs> but bless me too. <laughs> and then we continue to read verses 33 to 34. The Egyptian pressed to send the people out of the land quickly because they said, otherwise, we're all dead. The people took the do their dough before it had become leavened and wrapped their eating bowls in their clothes and on their shoulders. Israel didn't have time to sit around for a full day before leaving. And again, we see in our text the people of Mitzrayim or Egypt we're urging them to leave immediately. And we're sending them out of their land in haste. It is, of course, for this reason that Israel didn't have enough time to bake the bread before it was leavened. And thus it was unleavened. So how would I reconcile the scripture that says that Pesach is on the 14th of Nisan or Aviv? And how can we reconcile this with the fact that Adonai sent Israel out of Mitzrayim the very next day, on the first day of Hagar the 15th of Aviv or Nisan, what they, after they had eaten the Pesach the other night before. The Hebrew word here that we want to look at, Erev, means evening or sunset. Evening or sunset. So how can Pesach be observed on the 14th at Erev translate Evan, in the, uh, the King James Version, as Torah instructs, if it overlaps into the 15th? And I believe the answer is found in a very interesting Hebrew phrase, which is the title of my message. The passage in question is found in Leviticus 23, verse 5. Of course, you know Leviticus 23, or Vayikra 23, is God's daytime, it's his calendar for the year. Shabbat and Holy Days. Amen? In the King James Version, we read, in the 14th day, or the 14th, because it doesn't say day there, in the 14th of the first month at even is the Lord's Passover. Seems simple enough, right? <laughs> Easy for interpretation. At least according to this version, Pesach starts, Evan, or Erev, at the beginning of the 14th, which I understand starts the evening before, directly after the 13th, at sundown. So in the same way, this meant to me that Pesach was to be celebrated at the very beginning of Nisan 14, following the close of Nisan 13. But a more literal version of the same passage reads as such. In the first month, on the 14th of the month, between the evenings, between the evenings, the Passover to Hashem. Between the evenings. The key, I believe, in understanding the Hebrew phrase, Ben Ha'arba'im, which means between the evenings. So the question is, how many evenings are there in a day? How many evenings are does one day have? According to the scripture, each evening that is sundown belongs to the beginning of each day. And this should be a red flag to us. It should tip us off that this is something other than the regular evening that we think about or a sun that has set. So then the obvious question is, what does between the evenings mean in scripture? What does that mean? Returning to Shemot or Exodus chapter 12, verse 5 to 6 states, Your animal must be without defect, a male in its first year, and you may choose it from either the sheep or the goats. And you are to keep it until the 14th day of the month. And then the entire assembly of the community of Israel will slaughter it, Bain Ha'abaim, between the evenings, at dusk. Between the evenings. Now, if the lamb is being killed between an evening and another evening, 
one could conclude that the lamb is being killed before the final evening or sunset. Just follow me on this. Now, the rabbinical sages considered the phrase between the evenings to mean that there was literally two evenings within a day. Two evenings within a day. And according to these sages, the first evening started when the sun began to descend. Right? Like if you tell somebody, I'll, I'll meet you in the evening. Well, the sun's still up, but it's, it's evening time. Right? Between the evenings. So literally, as the sun begins to descend, it was sometimes called by the rabbis a little evening. A little evening. And it was a time of day when the sun, as I said, was just beginning to descend as the day drew towards evening. The second evening was the real sunset or the era, but not Lila, complete darkness. Era in complete darkness. If you are a pilot and you don't have your instrument rating, you've got to get your plane in at dusk. You got to get it into the airport before it is closhet or complete darkness. That in between time there, between when the sun sets and when we go into complete darkness. Now the word erev implies sunset. As I just mentioned, there are different levels of erev in the biblical day. The Hebrew phrase bein har ba'ayim does not have its boundaries starting at the final sunset, which is when the biblical day ends and shortly thereafter begins the next day. See, different translations, I'll help you with this, of Leviticus 23.5 will support this. And even, or Arab, is translated by the New Revised Standard Version, for example, as twilight. The JPS version gets a little more specific. It says dusk. The Chumash literally says, in the afternoon. Now previously I considered the Hebrew phrase, Ben Ha'arba'im, to mean between evening and complete darkness. As some versions like our complete Jewish Bible translated. But the Hebrew in question doesn't say that. The Hebrew doesn't say, Ben Ere Vechoshech, which is darkness, or Ben Ere Velala. The translation between evening and complete darkness would not be a literal rendering of the text. But this escaped my attention for a very long time. We also have other scriptural evidence that the Hebrew phrase bein harba'anim doesn't mean between evening and complete darkness. See, there is another passage that describes the time of the observance of Pesach in a slightly different way. And you find that in the last book of the Torah, Devarim, or Deuteronomy, specifically chapter 16, verses 5 to 6, which states, you may not sacrifice the Pesach offering in just any of the towns that Adonai your God is giving you, but at the place where Adonai your God will choose to have his name live. There is where you are. There is where you are to sacrifice the Pesach offering in the evening when the sun sets, at the time of year that you came out of Egypt. The text says Ba'arev, meaning at or on or in the Evan or Erev. So why does there need to be further clarification with the phrase Kivo Hashemesh? Literally meaning, as the sun goes. As the sun goes. It should be noted that the word down is not in Hebrew. There's no sun down. It's as the sun goes. Kivo HaShemesh doesn't mean that the sun is actually down. Only it has begun and this is like saying that perhaps you are traveling, but you haven't yet to arrive at your destination. This further substantiates the rabbi's stance 
that there were actually two evenings within a biblical day. As I was searching the scriptures, I came upon further evidence that supports the idea that the Hebrew phrase, Kivu HaShemesh, means as the sun goes, and not literally sun down. That's an important fact that you need to get your head around. It doesn't say sun down. It says, the Hebrew says, as the sun goes. First, we have to go again to Devarim. Let's, let's try chapter 21, verses 22 to 23a, which states, if someone has committed a capital crime and is put to death, then hung on a tree, his body is not to remain all night on the tree, but you must bury him the same day. Now, as mentioned before, the biblical day starts and ends at true evening, otherwise known as sunset. Our passage that I just read from Devarim says that someone hung on a tree is to be taken down before night. The text says it is to be done on the same day. In other words, it is to be done before sunset, before the next day. And the scripture passage is one of the keys for us understanding what the phrase between the evenings and as the sun goes really means. And I look to the book of Joshua or Hoshua, and I know it's kind of heavy, this is almost Beit Midrash or Torah study-ish, but with Passover being on the, the heels of Passover, I wanted, you to put, I wanted to put out there, since a portion sort of allowed me, to explain to you why we have moved the day of celebration, the Passover. When we read from Joshua chapter 8, verse 29, it brings it all together for us as it uses the phrase, at the going down of the sun, kavo uh, hashemesh, to describe when someone was taken off a tree. The Torah says, should be done on the same day. And it states that King of Ai, he, hung, he hanged on a tree until evening, at sundown. Yehoshua gave him, gave an order, so they took his carcass down from the tree, threw it at the entrance of the city gate, and piled on it a big heap of stones, which is there to this day. So furthermore, we know that the phrase at the going down of the sun means before sunset because of the crucifixion of Yeshua. We read from the Gospel, Yochanan or John 19 verse 31 states, it was preparation day, and the Judeans did not want the bodies to remain on the stake on Shabbat, since it was an especially important Shabbat. So they asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies removed. Now, the true underlying reason that they wanted to take the bodies off of the wooden stakes or trees was because of what we just read from Devarim 21, verse 22 and 23. As someone has committed a capital crime and is put to death, then hung on a tree, his body is not to remain all night on the tree, but you must bury him the same day. And it was even more important that this happened because the first day of Hagamat Soda, unleavened bread, was a high holy day and therefore a biblical Shabbat. But the fact is that they interpreted the mitzvah to take a person hung on a tree off before complete sunset. And therefore the phrase, at the going down of the sun, kavo hashemesh, cannot mean sunset, as in sundown. This is also important because according to scripture, Yeshua the Messiah was also our Pesach or Passover lamb. So therefore, just as the lamb was to be sacrificed between the evenings, so too was Messiah Yeshua sacrificed as he died between the evenings. And not at sundown or after sundown, the Bible scholar John Gill, uh, in his commentary that I read regarding the uh, timing of the Pesach lamb being killed also states this, the time of killing the Passover was after the middle of the day. And it is also said that if they killed it before the middle of the day, it was not right. 
And if they slayed after the middle of the day, before the evening sacrifice, it was right. He goes on to say the reason of this was because the lamb was to be slain between the two evenings, the first of which began at noon, as soon as ever the day declined. So, I hit you with a lot of stuff this morning. And the obvious question is, what does this all mean? What it means, if the Pesach lamb was to be sacrificed between the evenings, then it certainly could not be sacrificed during the transition from Nisan 13 to Nisan 14. This teaches us that Pesach is to be observed on the 14th of Nisan or Aviv between the evenings, then Ha'arba'im, and at the going of the sun, which is Kavo Hashemesh. And this explains why in Shemot, Exodus chapter 12, verses 18 to 20, we are told to eat matzah from the 14th until the 21st day, which if we count is eight days, but the next verse says we are to eat matzah and avoid leaven for only seven days. The Pesach lamb, lamb is killed between the evenings on the 14th of Nisan. This observance always overlapped the 15th of Nisan as the meal would be eaten into the night as it turned into the 15th day. And this explains how B'nai Israel could leave the very next day and how it could be the first day of Hagamatzot or the 15th of Nisan. So all this explains how with Pesach and Hagamatzot there is essentially only seven complete days of observance which kicks off on the 14th of Nisan between the evenings. So the sages of old, I guess, got it right. They got it right. Amen? I know it's a lot. So how do we reconcile this with Yeshua's Pesach Seder? Because did he not partake in the Passover Seder and become our Pesach Seder? How do we reconcile that? There seems to be more clarity in the Torah as to when Pesach should be celebrated as compared to the reasoning and clarity of why Yeshua celebrated his last Seder when he did. We have more evidence when we should celebrate Passover versus what Yeshua did. Okay? I can't claim, as some do, that Yeshua really didn't observe a Passover Seder. It's just some supper, some will say. That it wasn't a Seder with his Talmudim before his death. But in Luke 22, 11 through 15, we read, And say to its owner, The rabbi says to you, Where is the guest room where I am to eat the Pesach meal with my Talmudim? He will show you a large room upstairs already furnished. Make the preparations there. They went and found things just as Yeshua had told them they would be. And they prepared for the Savior. When the time came, Yeshua and the emissaries reclined at the table, and he said to them, I have really wanted so much to celebrate this Seder with you before I die. Some translations will say before I suffer. In Matthew, or Matthew 26, 17 to 19, we read that Yeshua and his disciples observed Pesach on the first day of unleavened bread. Now, of course, in the scriptures, unleavened bread can be used interchangeably describe the whole observance of Pesach and vice versa. The text states, on the first day for uh, Matzah, the Talmudim came to Yeshua and asked, where do you want us to prepare your Seder? Go into the city to so-and-so, he replied, and tell him that the rabbi says, my time is near. My Talmudim and I are celebrating Pesach at your house. And the Talmudim did as Yeshua directed and prepared the Seder. In any case, Yeshua and his disciples celebrated Pesach on the beginning of the 14th day of Nisan. It was 
the day of Pesach. That is the day that lambs would eventually, eventually be sacrificed between the evenings. But Yeshua's last Seder was not done during the exact time of the biblically mandated Pesach. It was not. And this is further made evident in the Gospel of Yochanan or John 18, verse 28, where it states, they led Yeshua from Kaifa, Kaifa to the governor's headquarters. And by now, it was early morning. They did not enter the headquarters building because they didn't want to become ritually defiled and thus unable to eat the Pesach. So the rest of B'nai Israel had not yet reclined for their Seder. Now it is hard to explain for sure why Yeshua celebrated an early Seder with the Talmudim. And I understand that. There's speculation involved there. Some say it was because he knew that he would die during the actual time to observe the commonly held time of the Pesach Seder. So in Luke 22, 15, it seems that Yeshua, he knew exactly that this was the case. As he says this, again, he says, I have really wanted so much to celebrate this Seder with you before I die. And perhaps by making the statement he was explaining to his Talmudim why they were observing their Seder a day early. Now granted, there could have been competing calendars during Yeshua's time, which would explain the different times people were celebrating Pesach. For example, the Essenes, you know, the Essene Jewish community celebrated Pesach one day earlier. But thus some simply insist that Yeshua was celebrating during the biblically mandated time. That's Judaism that's all wrong. And there are many people, I've been part of that camp for a while, believe that Judaism had it wrong. And that argument can be made, but we would also lose the significance of Yeshua being sacrificed at the same time that all the Pesach lambs are being sacrificed. That is critical to the Pesach story, or account, I should say. So the scriptures say that Yeshua is our Passover Pesach lamb. Rabbi Shaul says that in his letter to Corinth, chapter 5, verse 7. So after reviewing all the evidence once again, although it may have been early, I believe Yeshua's last Pesach Seder most likely was done early simply out of necessity. Now, it's possible. It's possible considering this is one feast and holy day where Yahweh or God gives people a little bit of wiggle room for observance. Especially under situations where one is not able to observe Pesach at the normal time. It's there in Scripture. The fact is, this was the one biblical feast that exceptions were made. Exceptions were made when it came to the date it was celebrated. For example, you can read that in Numbers chapter 9, verses 9 to 11, which states, Adonai said to Moshe, tell the people of Israel, <clears throat> if any of you now or in future generations is unclean because of a corpse, or if he is on a trip abroad, Nevertheless, he is to observe Pesach, but he will observe it in the second month, on the 14th day at dusk. They are to eat it with matzah and maror. So there it is, at dusk. Therefore, if we accepted the time of the traditional Pesach observance, I don't think that one could say that Yeshua's early Seder was contrary to Torah, based on the evidence already that there was some wiggle room as to when to observe it, based on circumstances. But an alternate time for observance would have to be based on some pretty special circumstances. I believe the 
death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord is pretty special circumstances. Now, if one is able to observe Pesach a month later due to someone coming in contact with another one's death, then surely one could observe Pesach one day earlier if the situation called for it, especially for the death of Messiah, as I said, in this Talmudian possible contact with his body right before the normal time of the Pesach observance. Or if they have going to deal with his body, they couldn't participate in the Seder. So, as I shared during our congregational Seder, in our day and in our age, we really don't literally celebrate Pesach. We don't. It's not possible because we cannot sacrifice the Pesach land and eat it. We observe a memorial of Pesach, but not the actual Pesach. This is also the reason why we don't pack up the congregation and make a trip <laughs> to Israel for its observance, since it is the Shalosh Regalim, requires going to Jerusalem, though Ted Pierce did challenge me on that. <laughs> Why don't you all go into Israel? Celebrate it there. I told him I got too many mouths to feed, Ted. In our day, when it comes to the observance of Pesach, we recognize that some flexibility in regards to when we celebrate Pesach. In Yochanan of John chapter 17, verse 11, our Master Yeshua praised the following words, I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them through your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are. See, as we remember some of Yeshua's last words and prayers before he left this world, let us honor his request for unity. And if anything, let us be unified in the one thing that he asked us to do remember to him, the Pesach. See, in our observance of the holy days, if it isolates us from our community, then we have forgotten something pretty darn important, which is Yeshua's prayer and have forgotten that Adonai wanted all Israel to celebrate together. And this actually is part of the mitzvah as Adonai commands all able-bodied men to come and celebrate the feast together, as seen in Shemot 23 or Devarim 16. We were not meant to keep the Torah in isolation while claiming that we are the only one that is right. Israel was meant to keep it as a community. That was the, the example that they set for us and certainly the will and desire of our Creator. And that's exactly what we did last year with First Friends Church. Was it a massive undertaking? Yeah, you betcha. It was a massive undertaking. But it was in the spirit of of Yeshua to come together with brothers and sisters in Yeshua and share the Passover. And we did that. In 1 Corinthians 1 verse 10, Rabbi Shaul exhorts us with the following words. Nevertheless, brothers, I call on you in the name of our Lord Yeshua the Messiah to agree all of you in what you say and not to let yourselves remain split into factions but be restored to having a common mind and a common purpose. No, the rabbi or the minister isn't always right. Sorry, but we can help make it right together, can't we? So as we wait for Messiah Yeshua to establish his soon coming kingdom, let us not only continue seeking truth, but let us also seek each other's shalom and fellowship 
in establishing his way this Pesach and for days beyond. Amen. Amen. Please rise. Let us pray. For Father, if I was always right, then I'd have to hang on a tree. I'm not always right. But Father, one of the greatest gifts to humankind is humility. Because Father, it strikes at pride. And when we become prideful and arrogant, thinking that we have all the answers, no longer do we carry the full spirit of Yeshua. But we invite Father, the very spirit that brought the vision into the world in Eden. The vision, Father, from holiness and unholiness. When holiness entered the world in the name of pride, we wanted to be our own gods. We wanted to do it our way. But Father, there's a right way. There's a way of Yeshua. There's a way of Torah. Or Yeshua's way is Torah. So Father, now the minister isn't always right. But there is a right way. And together, Father, we will search out your word, as Timothy exhorted us, and we will find that truth. By the power of your spirit, the leading of your spirit, as we pray, as Rabbi Shul told us, Constantly praying for knowledge, constantly praying for discernment, and constantly praying for wise application of these truths and knowledge. We thank you, Father, for your Holy Spirit that corrects us because your Spirit loves us. For, Father, you correct those whom you love. And, Father, you love us. And, Father, we pray for your ongoing and continued correction so that, Father, we will not compromise the way of Messiah. Thank you, Father, for the path of righteousness that we all desire to walk on. It's a narrow one, but, Father, one we will walk nonetheless. Thank you in our preparation for this coming Passover. May your spirit move mightily in worship and, in the, and throughout the Seder service, Father. We thank you, Father, for using us for your glory. In the Shoes name we pray. Amen. Tadonai Panavaleka Vikanecha Tadonai Panavaleka Desimlecha Shalom. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And I pray the Lord to lift his countenance upon you and grant you his shalom, his peace. Hashem Yeshua Adonai. And the congregation agrees? Amen. Amen. And amen.